Monday, November 29th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, the technology of WikiLeaks. Let's do this. 2010. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, the listeners want it, clearly. No one has exhibited any support whatsoever for not saying the date. Uh, I should have, you know, this is my problem, is I can never use the strategy of pretend I like it so that people switch back because they're picking it just because I don't like it. <laughs> Unless I start out lying from the get-go, which I never do because I am a non-liar. Non-liar, eh? That's right. Ever? Nope. Ever? Nope. In your entire life, you've never lied? No, that's, uh, I've lied <laughs> in, ever since I have become a non-liar. I, I remember that <laughs> we, that one argument we were having, it was like two or three years into RIT, and someone pointed out that you had lied in recent memory, and then your response was, I think, yeah, that was before the non-lying time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I became a non-liar only, you know. So I got kind of an aside from work, and I obviously can't use the names of vendors because this is all BS, but here's some examples of the BS that goes on when it comes to enterprise software. Oh, yeah. How much does this cost? Well, you have to call us. Yeah. Oh, okay, let's talk about how much it's going to cost. How much do you have? <laughs> how much is your budget for this project? Well, then we'll decide how much it's going to cost. Aside from the fact that enterprise vendors seem to magically pull 50 to 80% discounts out of their asses when you say you're not going to buy their product. Yeah. I, there's another thing that I don't think a lot of people realize, and I want to point this out because we have a lot of tech people listening, and... This is something that you need to cover your butt about. So say you've got a product and you, you need to buy a product that does this thing. And you don't you, have time to develop it, which would be the right answer. Yep. It, that's usually, sadly, the right answer. So you need a <laughs> thing and there's only... You and know, there's like, no open source solution. And even if there was, it's, it's flawed or maybe you have to hire someone who would cost a lot of money to take <laughs> care of it. An open source solution flawed? <laughs> yeah. It's not ticketing because systems. Because it's it's some weird business thing you got to do. That, it's not ticketing systems, know. but I'll say this. I was looking at ticketing systems again, and dear Lord, are the open source ticketing systems so desperately GNU painful. Well, they're all meant to be used. They're no, all no, designed no, no, no. by small-time guys for small projects. No, I'm not, not even. Some of them claim to be big and enterprise or they're and all, scaly. Or they're all hippie. And they're not bug trackers. I learned not to look for bug trackers, but I found three really kind of big-looking ticketing systems that did a lot, command-line-only source distribution. Yep. Who's going to use that? Eh. So, anyway, it's not a ticketing system. It's something else that I need. And now, uh, hypothetically, say there's only, like, three vendors who actually make this thing. Cartel. So you go to <laughs> all three of them and get quotes, and you make a requirements, doc requirements document, and you're like, here's what I need, and you give it to them. And none of them are able to do what you want. <laughs> so, none of them can check off everything on the list. Yeah, so then you get a demo from all of them, which is the only way to try But do they have any, do they have plug-in architectures? Maybe there's a <laughs> plug-in out there. <laughs> you know, Microsoft does. Yes, Microsoft does. <laughs> Microsoft doesn't make what you need? No, Microsoft doesn't make what we need. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so you go, to these, you go to multiple vendors, and you get demos of all their software, and you got to sign all the NDAs and whatever to actually try out their software. You have to sign an NDA to try out something that is a product for sale. So I'm going to go to Best Buy. No, you can't look at the TVs that you're going to buy until you promise never to tell anyone what these TVs look like. So let's say that of the three vendors, none of them do what you want, but one of them says, all right, dude, look, if you'll sign a contract with us, We'll put in writing that we'll do all those things, and we'll work directly with you because obviously you know more about this product than you know a lot of our other customers. Then I would say I would like to talk to some of your other customers. Yeah. So <laughs> say that say that works. I mean, say you've got a company that's kind of new on the market in this thing, and they basically are willing to implement whatever you want. Are they going to go out of business tomorrow? No. <laughs> and you have the option of walking away if they don't provide it. You don't have to pay until they've made the entire list complete, and they will let you walk away if you're not satisfied at the end. All right. Without giving them even one penny. Yeah. All right. Because obviously they stand to gain more than you stand to gain. And, you know, they're competing against the other two vendors that maybe have a more entrenched market share. Don't be surprised if the other two vendors threaten to sue you on the grounds that all the features in your requirements document that you gave them before they, you saw their software in a demo... They claim that you got the idea for all that from using their software. Uh-huh. My advice to you is simply this. As Doesn't your requirements document have a date on it? Oh, yeah. Those are easily forged. 
<laughs> yeah. So now, obviously, there's no trouble on my side. I've handled this adroitly, and there's no trouble. <laughs> but for anyone who is new in the realm of of negotiating with enterprise bullshit software, make sure you read contracts very very explicitly. Ignore threats of lawsuits unless they actually sue you. Have a lawyer. If you don't have a lawyer, you really shouldn't be buying enterprise software in the first place. <laughs> I mean, you're not big enough to use enterprise software. I would like to know, however, uh, what variety of software this is so I can make an open source solution ah. or make my own enterprise version and then kick those other guys' asses. So obviously I'm not saying publicly because... Because I've obviously never used or seen any of their programs, so there's no way they could sue me. There are so few vendors in this realm that it would be trivial to figure out what companies I'm talking about. I've made a, I've made a list of like vertical uh, software markets where I know a lot of money could be made because the existing you know choices are so slim. Oh, change management, document management, ticketing. Well, I mean, those are just ones that you, I, I'm talking about. Stuff like the one that I know the most about is uh, you know every sporting uh, of, of official or semi official sporting event in the entire country, possibly near the world, right from college on up uses the exact same piece of software to track the statistics of every player in every game, you know? So someone's watching a college basketball game between Schmuck Team 1 and Schmuck Team 2. They're typing in, so-and-so player number 34 scored two points at three minutes and five, you know, 54 seconds, you know, with an assist from so-and-so on the whatever team. They All of this is tracked in this one piece of software that some guys wrote in their garage that has yep. this archaic, like, you know, keyboard interface. There's, like, codes. You got So you got to know, like, you know, for basketball, FP is this and QR is this other, right? It's a lot like medical transcription, which actually has the same problem. Oh. Oh. You know, but in other areas, there are also very few competitors, like uh, Dennis Office, right? Software to actually interface with x-ray machines and store all the x-ray images. Yep. Not too many of those. Well, in general, anything related to healthcare has that problem. Also, I mean, anything related to industrial maintenance, mm. like uh, maintenance scheduling or inventory management, they, they all have the same problem. Yep. But suffice it to say, I cannot actually let on to what this software is. I mean, tell me, I didn't mean to tell me now, I mean, tell me after. So Maybe, can... probably <laughs> not. You're never going to find out. Because I think I've convinced a company to actually follow the requirements document that I wrote and build exactly what I want. Uh, how about that? And one of their competitors may or may not have threatened to cause trouble, and they're obviously full of shit. This so is they're... actually, this, this is a third situation. It's like, oh, I can't afford to develop it myself, right? But if all the enterprise guys want to charge you an arm and a leg... You can just hire, outsource to a good development team, not just some schmucks in India, but, you know, a real development team. Not that I'm sure there are real development teams in India. I just haven't seen many of them. Uh, well, the, the, the trouble there is pretty <laughs> simple. Anytime you get a resume where someone is very specifically a Tomcat, WebSphere, Java developer... They probably only know that and nothing else and don't yes. even know that that well. But I mean, yeah, I'm not talking about hiring developers. I'm talking about outsourcing to a company that basically makes custom software. You know, you can hire a, a group of developers that is already a team that already makes things together True. Don't and expect say, here's the requirements. I want you to make a piece of software that does this. Don't expect to ever be able to maintain that code. No, but you can maintain the relationship with that company uh, if yes. it's a U.S. company. Of course, then they've and got it you. might be it might you know it could cost a lot less than some ridiculous <laughs> enterprise software contract. It easily could. I actually do recommend that over developing yourself, unless you have dedicated developers, because that otherwise, you're keep on staff otherwise you're going to get some guy who writes something in Perl that no one else knows how to deal with ever. Yep. But a problem you may run into when dealing with this sort of software is that. If you have a long-standing relationship, this is not the case, obviously, in this situation, with an enterprise vendor, and you try to walk away, they will, more often than you would expect, try to use legal pressure or effectively all but blackmail to force you to maintain a business relationship with them. Mm. They will threaten to send the BSA after you. Relationships like this go sour real quick the moment you say you're not going to pay for something. Yep. So one IT professional to another... That I could do a whole show on this stuff, but this is like RIM's I Enterprise IT tip of the day. <laughs> and they're all fuckers. Everything sucks. <laughs> There's no, I don't know what I can say. Yeah. Anyway, so in the news, right, Microsoft, who I just mentioned a few seconds ago, they've actually, you know, sort of uh, figured things out maybe a little bit, right, uh, in terms of the o world of openness, right? So what happened was, is when, at first, when they were, everyone was trying to hack the Connect. 
Microsoft was like, oh, you fuckers, don't even try that shit. Uh, but then, like, a week later, they're like, oh, never mind. But then a cool. week later, they were like, oh, oh, we thought you meant by hacking the Kinect that you were, like, trying to cheat or that you were trying to, you know, make your own Kinects. Oh, I think there, one of the claims was reverse engineer the actual code in the, in the Xbox that yeah, handles the Kinect data. We thought that you were going to, like, make your own Kinect. So, you know, so that you could sell bootleg connects or that you were trying to, you know, cheat at connect games or some of that kind of bullshit. But apparently you're not. You just want to use connect with your computer or whatever. And you know what? We have no problem with that. That's totally cool. It's hard to tell if the reversal was due to bad publicity or due to a legitimate mistake. There's well, it could have been. I, I think what it was was uh, was actually, you know, first of all, everyone knows that Microsoft is sort of a dysfunctional, many parts not working in concert, but not as bad as Sony kind of organization, right? But I think basically what it was is, you know, there was a big news story because they put out a bounty. So Microsoft, you know, the bureaucracy of it automatically reacted to a news story with its name in it, right? With the automatic legal, you know, worded reaction. But then it must have been that some sane person at Microsoft <coughs> in a position of power actually looked at it and said, uh, okay, so our automatic legal reaction was not entirely the correct reaction. Let us correct it. And they did. Now, think of this. That is just, this is an interesting That is aside. the Occam's Razor explanation. That if that's true, that corporations in many ways, and we, we already know this, act like organisms that will have their own reactions to events independent of any individual human making a decision. Mm-hmm. I mean, bureaucracies, even without a corporation, just a bureaucracy of any kind can do things that no individual human at any point in the chain would actually want to do or be willing to do or even be ethically charged to do. And yet the corporation. Well, the what it is, is that this, the people who are doing it. Right. I mean, they are doing it with intent. Right. But the thing is, they're not actually uh, considering, nor do they care. Right. It's, or or they're just, not. Their, their job is to sit here. Some guys job is to. Sir, look at news stories about Microsoft and give the official response. Ah, but sometimes to them. it's the paralysis of the crowd, where one every person, no person has authority to stop it directly or to do the whole thing directly. Everyone does a tiny piece, and then the actual decision-making authority is deferred somewhere else. And everyone makes yeah. tiny decisions where I may not agree with this, but my job's just to pass the news story on. Well, I mean, I it, may not agree with this, but my job's just to send the C and D. It's like a customer service representative, right? You call them, and they you get the script. And you really can't get them off script, no matter how hard you try. I've tried. Uh, right? Obscenities. <laughs> that doesn't get them off script, right? They have a script for obscenity. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's like everyone well, just, everyone's, a guy's bored at his job. His job is PR guy, respond to news stories about Microsoft with the official response. And he just does it, and he doesn't really care what the response means or anything. It's just like, hey, stop hacking our shit. That's well, their official response. I've already seen a lot of cool Connect hacks. Some guy yeah. was playing Mario with it very poorly. But in addition, though, it's somewhat interestingly, right? Uh, they've given a similar response to the uh, you know, jailbreaking of Windows Phone 7 hacks. Ah, I, I think I can tell you why there. They're not selling. <laughs> They're not selling for crap. So Microsoft is probably thinking, all right, we're fucked on this anyway. What did Apple do? What are people mad about that Apple does? Let's do the opposite. Well, no, they didn't do the opposite. What, you know, <laughs> basically, you know, Apple's response is like, do not jailbreak. You know, they even tried to try to argue that it was illegal. You know, Microsoft is basically like, look, you know, uh, you're just going to ruin your phone. You're going to void your warranty. Don't do that. We can't stop you. But really, we suggest you don't do that. But we can't stop you. Right. And maybe updates might break, break it. But we can't stop you. Well, there's a big difference. That that's not the same as the the actually best response, which is, here is the source code for Windows Phone 7. You are free to do anything with it that you wish, except sell phones with this software on it without paying us, right? And uh, do whatever you want with your phones. Have, or, a good, have a good day. I'd even be happy with, all right, well, here's some drivers to interface with it. You're on your own if you want to do something with this phone. But mm. we're not going to stop you. Yeah. I mean, because really, the, they make their money with Windows Phone 7 because a company like, say, HTC will make a phone, and they'll want to put Windows Phone 7 on that phone. And so if they make 100,000 of that phone, they need to pay Microsoft 100,000 times copies of Windows Phone 7, and that gets integrated into the price of the hardware. You know, it's sort of like when you buy a Dell that has Windows on it, right? Dell actually buys the copy of Windows and then just gives it to you with the, and it's part of the price of the computer, right? 
So that's how they make their money. So it doesn't really matter if Windows Phone 7 OS is open source, right? But, you know, they're never going to do that because that's how they are. But it wouldn't matter because nobody could make and sell a phone with Windows Phone 7 on it and avoid, you know, their lawyers, right? That would be sort of incredibly difficult, except for Chinese phones, which are going to do that shit anyway. Yep. So they wouldn't actually lose money, you know, Either way, because of the way that carriers and phone manufacturers work, until that's busted up, you know, there's actually no real business reason to keep shit closed source, except maybe you want to hide some secrets that, oh, shit, our stuff Of course, sucks. at the same time, there's no active reason to support it or advertise it, because a small number of angry nerds are the only people who care. No, but what I'm saying is that, you know, it's the same situation I said with Apple. If you would just do it, even though there's no reason, you know, kind of to go either way, it would actually give you this great boost of people who, you know, because right now people are like, oh, let's hack it because every single thing that comes out, we're going to hack, no matter how obscure or useless, right? We're going to we're gonna jailbreak every phone on the market, no matter who it, what it is. But if they open source their phones, suddenly people are like, wait a minute. What? Well, I think and the people would flock to it. I, nah, I, I think the effect would be very small. I also think that at least Apple... Their fear, probably unfounded, well, is unfounded, is, I assume, that if the phones are totally open, people are going to be much better at writing exploits, they're going to have to worry more about security, people then are going to be like, is people are gonna be like, hey, grandma, I'll make your phone better, and then grandma gets a virus. Yeah, okay, what has more uh, security holes that are closed more slowly, i.e., Acrobat. Which, is, which is closed oh, source. Flash. Actually, this is a, here, I'm going to give a, a, a tech uh, alert to people, right? You may not realize this, but uh, Acrobat Reader has a bunch of serious security holes in it, and if you open up certain PDFs in it, uh, it is possible that they just take over your computer, especially, yes. especially if it's a Windows computer. Now, think of this. PDFs are generally, like, people, one, it's a document. Yep. Granted, there are a lot of macro virus, well, Trojans from back in the However, day. However, there is now a solution to this problem, right? If you are the kind of person who doesn't want to use an alternative PDF reader. Because and you, they suck. Right? First of all, uh, cr the newest, newest versions of Chrome have a PDF reader in them. Right? So, Ooh, I actually did not know that. Yeah. Uh, so it's not the greatest yet. It's not really, an, you know. And the thing is, a Acrobat Reader sucks, but really, all of the alternative PDF readers that you can get for Windows at least, right? On a Mac, you're good. You got Preview, right? And on Linux, you're good. You're good. So only on Windows you have an issue. You can get the stupid Foxit reader, which is, <laughs> it works, but it's full of drag. It's, it's like, you know, it's not spyware or virus, but it technically costs money and you could pirate it, but it's, eh, I don't, you know, it's so shady. I don't like that shit, right? Or you can get something like Events, which is the one that's used in Ubuntu, right? And it actually Ubuntu. runs on Windows, runs on Windows just fine, but it's actually got some bugs and it crashes sometimes and it can't handle every PDF. So you kind of want to use the Adobe Reader, even though it's evil and full of security holes. Adobe has released Adobe Reader X. You can get it now. So uninstall Adobe Reader 9 completely and install Adobe Reader X, and this will solve your security problems, and you'll be all right. I highly recommend this course of How action. How exactly does it solve the security problems? Couldn't Be it just have its own? No, because it is uh, the architecture of Adobe Reader X is one of isolation. So... The, the readers are sort of, it's sort of like a virtual PDF reader, right? It's like there's a virtual machine for each PDF you're looking at. Okay, so, just making sort sure. Sort of. It's basically sandboxing all the PDFs. There, there was an unstated assumption there that it was somehow better, but it wasn't actually said how. Yeah, it's, it sandboxes all the PDFs effectively. I'm not going to go into the details. I right? mean, remember. So you're, you, the worst any evil PDF can do is ruin itself. Granted, there's still the inherent flaws in Windows. Remember that old exploit? Well, it wasn't that old. Where that one archaic image format, I even forget what it if was. If you keep your window, if you got Windows 7 and you update it all the time and you don't do anything stupid like run some EXE from some shady place. Or look at a bad PDF. Right. Or, you know, take your computer with absolutely no firewall into a cyber cafe and then do everything on an unencrypted connection. You're going to be all right. Actually, if you do that, it's not going to hurt your computer. It'll just hurt all your accounts. Which is just as bad. Because if they hurt your accounts... In fact, they, he's worse. He's if, two more than X. If they hurt your accounts, then they can hurt your computer. So you don't want to do that. So very briefly, because I do want to talk a lot about WikiLeaks, uh, I want to talk about this interesting article pointing out something a lot of people have not thought about. Electric cars, if everyone has one, or even if, you know, a, a small but vocal minority of people have them in one area. We're talking about completely electric cars that you need to plug into the wall. Yes, or the electric hybrids that can be charged mm -hmm. because they draw, you know, a lot of power to charge. Yeah, you need to plug them into the washing machine-style power outlet. 
Now, we used to have the problem at the turn of the century, well, the turn of the last century, where the wiring in houses sucked and couldn't handle stuff. Like, you know, you'd have house fires because the tin wiring couldn't handle a fancy new electronic. <laughs> uh, tin wiring. In fact, there were even, like, back in the day, if you bought a toaster, you plugged it into an Edison socket, as in what you screw light bulbs into, because there weren't wall outlets yet. Mm -hmm. People only used stuff for lighting. So... That used to be the problem. So we fixed that. I mean, my modern fancy apartment has holes, Jerry, on every goddamn wall. There's like 100 holes in this apartment. I got plenty of holes. I have like nine circuits. It's I got, awesome. I got UPSs. I got, I'm loaded. But the uh, substations that provide power to individual groups of houses, they cannot give that much power. And if everyone in like a block in a subdivision is powering up their Tesla overnight... It'll probably overload that little substation. Yeah, they're already telling people, right? Don't use your washing machine during the peak hours, right? Because you know that'll uses too much electricity, and you know if and everyone runs their air conditioner at the same time, it sort of hurts the system. It's like, oh, it's ah, ah, but the trouble there. But imagine if every night, all night, was ultra peak because everyone was charging car batteries. You know, that's but at the like same time, serious load. the load is not the issue, the overall load, because we need more power during the day than at night anyway. So a lot of times excess, either things are powered down or spun down or excess power is lost. That's true. The stored. cars will be most likely plugged in at night when nothing else is really on. Yep. So, so baseline load is not the issue. It's actually the infrastructure between the baseline load and the high tension lines. And then all of that and like individual blocks of houses. Because our power infrastructure is laughably old and archaic. And this sure is just better out west, though, right? Most of this electric stuff is happening out west before it happens out east. So their electricity is much better than ours. Uh, except California was newer. the only state that had rolling blackouts. <laughs> well, it's California it has other issues. Uh, the real issue is just that, as you know, everyone intelligent has been saying for the last 20 years, American infrastructure is really old. I mean, there was a time when we would spend amounts of money that would seem ludicrous today, just building a bridge. And now all our bridges are 100 years old, yeah. and the ones outside of major cities are starting to collapse. Well, here's the major two reasons for that. Number one, we built all this infrastructure a long time ago before anyone else built any infrastructure, right? And we built it really well, so it keeps working, and we don't have a lot of money to replace it. And the but other, the other problem, old. The other problem is that we're very big, so we built a lot of stuff everywhere. We would build something somewhere, uh, and then we would, and we would choose to build something in a place that had nothing, as opposed to choosing to update a place that already had something. So I would actually, I don't know if the bigness is nearly as useful as of, of a factor as people always bring up. It is because if you're a place like say Luxembourg, you can just replace fucking everything. Ah, uh, no, <laughs> but here, here's my point. So the argument that you know broadband sucks in America because we can't wire everybody because everyone's so spread out. You could just wire a single major city really easily. People don't want to do that. I know, but the thing is, we could. Yeah. We very easily could. That the bigness of the U.S. is not an excuse for a failing infrastructure. It's only an excuse for having outdated infrastructure in areas that aren't population centers. I think one solution, actually, is if you look at you know infrastructure, the only infrastructure we're actually doing a good job of updating is the evil cellular infrastructure. They're getting the 4G. They're rolling it out in the big cities, right? It's coming. Uh, the thing is, right, that also is because there's this evil corporate structure around it. It's all private. If we, if you wanted new bridges, uh, you got to have a private bridge. It would probably work really well, and you would, mm. get a, you would get a brand new bridge right the fuck away, and there would be a $30 toll to go over that bridge every time. But at the same time, I feel like... It is a useful and valuable expenditure of taxpayer dollars to build infrastructure. Yeah, I agree that we should spend taxpayer dollars on infrastructure. That is a high priority. Uh, but there are not enough taxpayer dollars to pay for that and the other things. I think there would be. What, what other thing are you not going to pay for or what tax are you going to raise? Oh, just raise the income tax. All right. I'm fine with that. So now... As uh, someone who is in, who is near the top of the tax brackets, I am totally okay with paying 40, 50% of my income... If the trains fucking worked. <laughs> now, what do you, what's going to happen when you pay 40% of your income and the trains are no different? The revolution. <laughs> They're just cleaner. <laughs> yeah. <'Cause laughs> I don't want it to be cleaner. Because you know that's go. what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, I would be fine. You know, it's like if 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 actually, if paying actually got, if you actually got what you were going to pay for, it's like, sure, but we Thing don't, is, we don't get least, what we pay for now. At least in New York, we get what we pay for. If you look at our subway infrastructure versus how much it costs total, it does not cost that much for what we get. Yeah, because we're not... 
getting it much. We are. In fact, actually. we got a big service cut. See, anytime you think W train. I don't need that W train. W I'm on the seven. W seven train. hasn't been hurt. In fact, seven's growing. Uh huh. Seven's like the best train. Uh -huh. It is. All right. Never fucked me. It always fucks Conrad because he lives one stop away, not at the hub. <laughs> So anyway, things of the day. What do you got for me, Scott? Okay, so <laughs> the uh, the two thousand and ten the pirate party in uh, in Germany. I like the pirate party. Yes, they went to the airport for some protesting fun, and they did the most fun kind of protest that uh, there is in the world, which is the naked protest. Naked protest. Wait, all full Monty? No, they had underwear. Okay, because full Monty <laughs> is actually illegal in a lot of places, and <laughs> yeah, but they were basically like, hey. This scanner is going to, you're going to see our junk. Well, let's just let everyone see our junk. And they had some hot ladies with them. We should do that in America. You can go to the airport and get down to your underwear. No one's going to Actually, when is International No Pants Day? Because it should be coming up in like February. I don't know. But, I want to do that again. But yeah, you, uh, this is a, you know, pretty funny video. Uh, that I'm not, I'm now doing the Swedish instead of the German. Because Pirate is from Sweden, the you Pirate know, Party. I feel like two, three, four years ago doing Geek Nights, this is when I would have pointed out, hey, I'm not even wearing pants now, but you know what? And Scott, I'm actually wearing pants. He is indeed wearing pants. I don't However, know I am wearing the pants. What? You know, because I'm wearing, you know, you know who wears the pants? Me. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. you. Yes. Yes, <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm the pants wearer. So Conrad Wolfram, love him or hate him. Wait, Conrad Wolfram? That's yeah. his name? I thought it was Stephen Wolfram. Uh, you might be thinking of a different Wolfram. Wolfram Alpha guy? There is also a Stephen Wolfram. Huh. He d also did a TED Talk. I think the Stephen Wolfram is the Wolfram Alpha Wolfram. Yes. And I the Mathematica. I'm talking about Conrad Wolfram. I don't know who this is. He is. Conrad Wolfram runs the worldwide arm of Wolfram Research, the mathematical lab behind the cutting edge knowledge engine Wolfram Alpha. Then who is... Uh Stephen Wolfram. Stephen Wolfram is the creator of Mathematica. Which is the same people who did Wolfram Alpha. Yeah. So are these brothers? I didn't know there were two of them. I don't know. I really don't know. Oh, Conrad is the younger brother of Stephen. There we ah. go. I thought it was one guy. I only knew the one guy. Suddenly now I know there's two guys. So he gave a TED Talk, and uh, I think you should all watch it. It's my thing of the day. But I, I kind of had a sea change of my own personal opinion. The gist of this talk is that we teach math in, pro in school, you know, kindergarten through 12th grade and even college, in the order of complexity of computation. Yep. So we do calculus last because it is really goddamn hard to calculate advanced calculus. Mm -hmm. To sit down and actually compute it and be like, what's oh, the integral? Multiply by one, multiply well, that's by because one again. The, this math curriculum was created before the time of calculators. Yes. So he argues that in a world with computers, we should still teach computation, but we should not teach mathematics and theory in the order of difficulty of computation, but instead in the order of difficulty and usefulness of application and theory. I, I sort of agree, right? Uh, I just think that we need to take also into account, right? It's like you should learn the math that is most practical in everyday life first. And if math, if there is a math that is not practical for use in everyday life, it really just shouldn't be taught in public school and only in, you know, for your special field. So special? Yeah. So if you're a physicist, you should learn the math that physicists need to know that normal people are never going to need to know in everyday life. See, well, life. he goes a little bit further and points out that, you know, even at a young age, if we forget, you know, if we ignore the computation and let the computers do it, you can teach very young children the high-level concepts of calculus, and those concepts mm. are actually pretty damn useful. And he mm. shows this interesting idea, and he used his daughter as an example. It worked pretty well. But you can use advanced maths and sit a kid down and be like, here are the tools, here's a problem, and point out that maths actually make it very easy to solve this problem, and then learning the computation beyond, obviously, arithmetic, which every kid should learn, and everyone in the world should know very mm. well. I, I think he makes a really good point, and he can make it better than I can. But toward the end, he talks a little bit about programming, and I, only not, on I not only agree with him, but I want to go one step further, because I used to argue that technological literacy is tantamount to literacy in the modern world, and I still agree with that. But 
I'm not saying we should drop calculus from the curriculum. I'm just using it as an example. We teach things like calculus and all these very specific things because they're considered core education in America. I feel like we should drop some of those less directly practical things, like maybe calculus, from the guaranteed everyone has to do this goddamn it curriculum. And I think programming, not computer literacy, I mean straight up object oriented programming should be one of the core fundamental things that everyone has to learn. Oh, I'm going to go a step further than that. I think we should make the fifth subject be technology, and everyone should learn everything from transistors all the way up. And on top of that, we shouldn't drop a damn thing. These kids are working too easy. They're not learning enough in school. Year-round school, you're learning more. Uh, I argue... And you know what, teachers' unions? Fuck you. All right, I argue against year-round school for one reason and one reason alone. Every all the studies say it's just better for in every possible uh, way. Except actually, they don't. The kids are less happy. Actually, <laughs> because the, they don't get to have a summer off. Every study I've seen has actually been a comparison, not just on year-round school, but between all the countries that have year-round school and the ones that don't. And the ones that have year-round school have fundamentally different educational systems. Yeah. And the system is probably much more the effect. I got to change you. I'm not talking about changing the changing whole thing. Changing the system. Year-round school is not the answer. It doesn't actually seem to be the causative factor. Uh, you still, there's no reason that we had to cut out anything. No. Get your asses in gear, well, kids. The reason I say cut something out is because, think about this, a lot of people's arguments against this idea stem along the lines that, you know, programming's hard or I don't need it for my job, but you can say the same thing about high-level math and you trigonometry. Do. The thing and is... Yet, but here's the thing. We, we say... You know, so how many people say, yeah, I sucked at math in high school. I never learned trig. You know, m math stupidity is kind of an accepted social thing. And yet programming stupidity is not when arguably they're equally important. I think it should be mandatory programming in school, pretty much throughout school, just like math and social studies and reading are and history and everything. But simultaneously, if you suck at it, that's no different. I mean, some people suck at math. Some people suck at language. And you know what? As long as you can become a productive member of society, yeah, you failed programming in first, fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade. A lot of people failed math in those grades, but we have to try. Uh, I think that actually, you know, it's like uh, there is some maths, right? Like calculus. Oh, that's a separate thing. You're Statistics. never, you're never going to use in your life if you're, say, uh, you know, I don't know, like a, a watch repairman, right? But even programming, no matter what your job is, right? Even janitor programming you will use it if you know it and you won't use it if you don't know it but it can help every single job where there is a computer anywhere near you right you know well so one of the things conrad argues is that math education and programming education should be hand in hand they should in fact be the same curriculum uh, i don't think so because programming at least modern useful programming for everyday people what they would actually help them with their jobs oh no 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 you think, think, here's an example much further away from the math theory here's, sort of programming no. of, of a computer science you're, you're not degree. you're not thinking about this so here's an example here's here's a high level math concept we teach the concept we show the applications of it and then in the cross curriculum in the programming classes, you have to implement it to do something. Yeah, that helps you learn the math by it also better helps you learn by the programming. programming, and it helps you learn some programming. But that programming that you're learning is not going to actually uh, help you that much with everyday sort of programming, right? If you're really good at writing See, no, no, Scott, here's basic the difference. programs no, Scott, Scott, to Scott, solve Scott. math problems, you are that is not going to help you write a website that integrates with Facebook. But the right? website Which is that what normal with people Facebook need to do. is actually not what he thinks is important. I, mean, I think that that that's, is what's important. Uh, uh, I'd <laughs> that's recommend, the most important. I'd recommend you watch this TED Talk because he makes an interesting point that the high-level math and the high-level programming actually could have more impact, but we live in a society where it often doesn't, where there are fields like biology, and basically everything but programming, where high-level math and high-level programming could revolutionize those fields. And physics is one of the few fields where that's actually happening. Yeah. And that we need to expand it, that we need to kind of try to get everyone to learn. See, he's math he's and thinking about scientists and academic people. I'm talking about, you know, some guy sitting in his office who is a salesman. Yeah, and right? Scott, we're not saying you know? anything different. Look at the way we do math now. Everyone learns basic arithmetic, and, 
you know, people who aren't, aren't dumb learn algebra, and then people who aren't, you know, difficult, don't have difficulties with math usually learn trigonometry, and the people who are going into science or who are really smart at math learn calculus. Programming would be the same way. Some people only get up to the Facebook website, and the p same people who would take calculus take calculus and advanced programming side by side. Uh, I think that the, the math programming of basically writing programs that do the same thing that calculators in Excel already do uh, no, for you he actually, is a lot less impactful on everyday life and will provide less helpfulness to normal people in their everyday jobs than actually learning how to program Scott, you didn't, real things. you didn't listen to anything I said. people use every day. Look at the way we currently do education. The majority of people who go through high school don't actually ever take calculus because it'll never be applicable to their lives and they never get to that level. But that should still be the goal for anyone who can do it. Mm. Not everyone's going to do the high-level math and the high-level programming, but that should be the course that is the equivalent of what the course to calculus is in current high schools. Most people won't get there. Most people don't get there now. Uh, I think that people should, you know, figure out what they're going to do with their lives and then learn what's appropriate to it and don't bother learning what's not appropriate except, to it unless they really like learning. Except most people don't figure out what they're going to do with their lives. Well, that's another problem we need to I just, <laughs> I don't know, out. I, I kind of disagree with you, but watch the TED Talk. We can talk about this as a separate show. All right. But the main gist here is I no longer think that we should just teach technology. I think programming should specifically be required curriculum for every single student. I always thought, you know, it should be part of technology is programming. That yeah. is, you know, I so, never thought differently. Very briefly, the meta moment will be at MAGFest, PAX East, all that stuff. The book club book was World War Z by Max Brooks. We're going to review it. I'm almost it. done. Almost done? Almost done. Stop breathing into the mic. All right. Yeah. That book sucked. I'm sorry. Okay. It's just you got to give me, can you like lay off? No, it? I can't. Cause I got to get it all really, out. You're not, you're like disturbing the legitimacy of the book club. I went back and read like the last 30 pages again, just to try to be like, well, maybe it wasn't so bad. Uh huh. <laughs> Uh, anyway, anyway, uh, are there any other and metas? the next book club book? I think I might want to announce it right now because it's my pick. Are you going early? Yeah. All right. So I, I was suddenly inspired. You just can't hold back. You can't wait until the appropriate time. This is a book I read a long time ago when I was in high school. This is going to be terrible. And I I can already see. I'm really interested to see how it holds up now because I I remember. Oh, this is going to be a terrible D and D book. No, it's not. Uh. I remember a lot of the concepts. And a lot of it I actually apply to... Oh, it's going to be a painful nonfiction book. It's not... Well, it's not going to be painful. No. The next book club book is Michio Kaku's Hyperspace. Oh, what the hell? That's Have you ever read Hyperspace? <laughs> it's huge. It's not that big. It's big. It's not that big. It's real big. <laughs> you know, he teaches over at uh, CUNY. It's I know. I kind of I, I want to go see him someday. Uh, and you get to pay for classes. Yeah. Every now and then he does a lecture. You've got to mm. keep an eye out. So Michio uh, Kaku's mm, Hyperspace will be the next book club book. What are you doing to me? You can't <laughs> pick anything fun. Fine, never mind. Ulysses. <laughs> War and Peace. I'm going to... War and Peace is actually better. Really? Have you read it? Better than Ulysses. Have you read it? I've examined both works. I, I as in flipped through them? <laughs> <laughs> Enough to know that I would... Ra if I had to choose between one of the two... Fine, I would I'll pick... The other, my other candidate was one of those D&D &D books, Pages of Pain no. by Troy Denning. <laughs> no, how about we pick something like Cat in the Hat, all right? Well, you know what? You get the pick next, and this is revenge. Cat in the Hat comes back. That's it. It's revenge <laughs> for goddamn zombie bullshit. And there's a monster at the end of this book. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really good book. Actually. I know, that's right. <laughs> book club, Monster at the End. Every book club should be double book club. One really hard book and one really easy book. <laughs> you know what'll happen? It'll be like Apple Geeks. They've got the main Apple Geeks and the Apple Geeks light. The light but if like if the really hard book is less hard. So if it's like War and Peace, it, War and Peace has to go with C Spot Run. But if you if you bring it down, if you bring like Lock Glamour, it's like, well, Lock Glamour we can go with instead of C Spot Run, it could be like The Little know, Prince. Super Fudge. <laughs> Super Fudge was a good book. I'm just, you know, it's like you got to add them, two books, but added together see, have to be. I have this worry that what'll happen is in the forum, we'll see a thousand posts about C Spot Run. <laughs> I know you like C Spot Run, but you know what? I will give you a fucking Clifford because I know you hate that shit. <laughs> so, without further ado, after, you know, 40 minutes of dicking around. Yeah, the show's a hot, uh, long show, but you know what? It was just a holiday, so we'll give you the long show. Double episode. Not really. More like one and a half episodes. Uh, 1.6, I'm thinking. That's what the rate's looking like. Well, we'll see. So, WikiLeaks. Now, we had this idea because... It's WikiLeaks, not WikiLeaks. 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 Wiki. It's not Wikipedia, it's Wikipedia. Uh, most e. people, what do most people say? Wikipedia. They say it quick. It's, mm -hmm. it's at best, it's a schwa in there these days. It's a wiki, 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 wiki. 
You know where Wiki Wiki came from, right? The Wiki Wiki bus. Yeah. In Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the we, Wicca Wicca bus. I we wanted to do a show on WikiLeaks for a while, but at the same time, it really would have been a Thursday show. You know, the social ramifications and whether or not we agree with it, and all. You know, there's all this kind of we could you could do like weeks and hours and months of just discussion on we WikiLeaks. Could, we could do WikiLeaks. Well, I guess it really doesn't fit into Tuesday or Wednesday, but Monday and Thursday shows we could like four of them just with WikiLeaks. Yep, but. There's one aspect that a lot of people aren't really talking about, and I think it actually warrants a lot, is just the technology behind WikiLeaks, what it is, how they do it, how to defeat them, how to make them indefeatable. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not just WikiLeaks itself, right? I mean, there's the WikiLeaks website. There's, uh, you know, the people who are, you know, getting leaked, right? The governments, they're the embassies, right? And then there's the third person, which is the person who takes the information from the governments leak, and then leaks it to the WikiLeaks. And all of these three areas, there are a lot of technological issues to discuss, especially in the realms of security and identity and networking. Mm -hmm. So which, uh, which, three are, which area do you want to start? And we can discuss what they did wrong and what they should do. Let's start with WikiLeaks itself. And all right. Because, you know, they... The organization, it's interesting that there actually is a website and an actual direct, you know, here it is website. Because I note that it was DDoS for like a day and a half prior to and during the release of all these cables. Mm -hmm. And there's no way you can tell me that that wasn't governments trying to hold back as much as possible. Well, wasn't WikiLeaks originally like just, you know, a, a wiki, just like MediaWiki, the same wiki software that Wikipedia uses? Yeah, well, I don't want to get into all and the And now it's sort of, of it. like its own website. But what's interesting is that any whoever decided that a DDoS of WikiLeaks was a good idea, and I don't think it was just people clicking on the site trying to actually get it, is the fact that the leaks are going to be distributed via torrent. So how are you going to stop it? I mean, the, the one original tracker went down, and within well, like five yeah. minutes, there was another tracker. Yeah, what I find the most interesting, right, is it's like, okay, so even if you take down the WikiLeaks website, you think that might help you because no normal people won't get the information. Only technologically advanced people will get the, the, you know, get the files. But the the thing that really blows the whole, you know, the shitter is that all these newspapers are taking the data and reporting on it. So... Why? What's the point of even taking WikiLeaks' website down at all? It's not helping you. Actually, you know? I was about to say that because, of all places, The Guardian, basically, before I even had time to download the torrent, highlighted all the interesting shit. Yeah. <laughs> In, like, this bulleted list. And I'm sure, you know, as days go on, people will grep and find more interesting shit that's probably, you know, of lesser impact. Here, let's do a really quick aside. What's your favorite story from there? My favorite story that I've seen, because I've seen uh, a bunch of them. My favorite one is still the guy on the horse who escaped. Yeah, that that's, just, that's a, it's a pretty good you know, story. It was just one of those neat things that historians would never have known about, and yet now that'll probably be in some history book somewhere. Yeah. I like just a lot, you know, it, for me it's just sort of like the general thing of, you know, all the, you know, uh, diplomatic relations between countries are like a bunch of friends who have really shitty drama and they're really just immature morons. Yeah. Read, and just in these? general, just all that shit. It's like, come on, you know, fucking grow up. Do a said replace with anime related proper nouns. And it's the bullshit drama between the RIT anime club and Arwag. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's like stuff. thou hast insulted me. It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're a fucking country. You're insulted by somebody who said something about me. Oh, did you hear that shit? Mm -mm. I do have to give them the smackdown. That is not okay. You know, it's but like, I do like the, the, uh, the direct, you know, kind of someone who thinks they're talking to someone in confidence. Like when an ambassador's like, yeah, the president of X country is such a douche. Yeah, it's like... That's the kind of thing I say to Scott after we go to a party. It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you so immature? You're supposed to be the leaders and the people running the world at the high country level, and you're just the same douches that everyone else is. Why are, you know, it's like, if just the FRC was in charge of every country, everything would just be so much better, because everyone would just be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> what's going on oh yeah you know you did that i know i don't like that but eh, it's your country but what's interesting i'm mature i'm an adult i'm not gonna be a jerk is that wikileaks is relatively open i mean the location of their servers is known yep the the front the leader of the organization ostensibly you is know, a known person a known person who, with shadiness around them except at the same time it's interesting how like 
That's the best they could get on him. The governments of the entire world want nothing more than for this guy to disappear. And yet not only has he not disappeared, but the best they could get is a sexual harassment lawsuit in Sweden. Yeah. That is the best the world government conspiracy can do, and you people think there's a new world order ready to take over any day? <laughs> uh, all right. But technologically, too, there's just a website and BitTorrent. And BitTorrent is not exactly the most reliable and safe protocol. Well, I mean, with BitTorrent, it would be really hard for them to stop everyone from sharing the torrent, right? That's very, very difficult. What isn't so difficult, though, is to just see who's on the torrent. Ah, but here's the safety in the crowds. It's fucking everybody. Yeah. Do you know how many tens of thousands of leechers and seeds there were today yeah. on all those torrents? No, of course. I so mean, the government makes a database of everyone who stole the secrets. Ah, shit. It's everyone who owns a computer. <laughs> Now what? <laughs> now what? Right. Also, but what the thing is, right, is you could use some sort of Tor proxies anonymizers so that you are not listed on the torrent, but you still get the torrent. Another thing you can do is there's a lot of places now, they're actually selling uh, or renting out, you know, hosted servers that you can get in, fo- in weird places around the world yep. that you can then torrent from and then download from those computers to your computer. Even you know, it's like you buy a torrent machine that just sits out in some country somewhere doing your torrents for you and seeding and leaching and all that stuff. Even look at Amazon S3. You can pick which legal jurisdiction you want your data to be in and you can encrypt it if you want. Yeah, on Amazon, actually, some people were talking about getting some EC2 Amazon machines to use for torrenting, you know, and that totally works. There's no reason you can't do that. But this is what I find really interesting, and I haven't quite formed my opinion yet on it, but despite the pretty much open and slapdash nature of how this data gets out, the world governments are, like, desperately impotent to stop it. Like, they are impotent to a degree that is laughable. Here's how to stop it. Find out what country it's in. Go take the computers. All right, it's in Sweden. What do we do now? Invade Sweden? No, you don't do it. Sweden has to do it. Yeah, but Sweden doesn't seem that interested in doing well, it. Well, in tough shit. <laughs> it's, it's how it's got to go. Now, the thing is, that's not necessarily safety. I mean, part of the problem of WikiLeaks is that they could, a concerted effort could bring down the website and every public person involved. So I know there's the security file and all that other kind of stuff, and I'm sure the real, like, the other people behind WikiLeaks who are probably relatively anonymous, I assume have all sorts of disaster scenarios. Mm -hmm. But if I were them, I would actually do something pretty simple. The next step of WikiLeaks, now that it's well known, is to publish a series of public keys. Mm-hmm. And and just publish them anonymously. You know, laptop in a car that connects to random Starbucks and puts them in places for people to get later. Mm-hmm. And get them all over the place. Well, the Say, thing is, they have to publish these public keys. People have to know that these public keys are definitely, verifiably the WikiLeaks keys. They're not just because I can just publish a public key and say it's a WikiLeaks key. And how will you know if it is or if it isn't? Yep. One way to do this would be to publish a sort of master key while WikiLeaks is still up and known. Yeah, on the WikiLeaks website. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, one seed, you just need, as long as there is some way for people involved in WikiLeaks to prove not who they are, but to prove that they signed whatever document is now out there. Yeah, they really just need one RSA public key that's like, you know, they could do a 4096 or whatever, right? And then anything that WikiLeaks publishes, sign it with that key, right? And then. Uh, anyone out there who got a document could verify that this is an, uh, a valid, you know, this document came from WikiLeaks. There would be zero, absolutely zero mathematical doubt that this document was released by WikiLeaks and not by someone else. And yet at the same time, while you've kind of, it's interesting, you've created an identity that is foolproof, and yet you've created an identity that is not tied to an actual person. Nope, it's tied Maybe to you've got a number. You might have a cabal of 13 people who each have the private key. Yep. And as long as none of them get compromised, and here's kind of a, a very specific technical thing. TrueCrypt is actually a great means of encrypting things. How, and the best part about it well, is that the just so-called... En- well, that just in- is a product that encrypts your hard drive. No, 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 no. But specifically the fact that it automatically, well, at least easily does deniable encryption. Mm-hmm. The problem with the deniable encryption is that it's mathematically breakable if the data changes a lot. Mm. Like, if you encrypt your whole hard drive, it's pretty obvious, all right, you gave us a password that gave us an empty Windows install where Firefox went to slash dot once four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, mathematically, we can prove you've got another partition in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. So the way around this, what TrueCrypt is great at is taking your private key and putting it in there with 10 passwords that give 10 different bullshit keys. <laughs> 
There, there's basically no way to actually force one of these keys out of someone. Mm-hmm. So, well, uh, there, there's still there are more complicated issues around that. But suffice it to say, if you did something like that, that would kind of be the next stage from WikiLeaks. The sort of completely distributed, you know, info dumps from Starbucks's to 4chan. Yeah, but you would, you know, you would basically buy using, you know, public private key, you know, cryptography and encryption and such. You would know verifiably that, you know, even though this is just some file on a weird BitTorrent somewhere, that it was definitely a WikiLeaks document confirmed 100%. You can also go one step further and make the so-called like debt all bomb insurance file. You know, the, the file you distribute everywhere that's encrypted that can only be decrypted with the original private key. So if there's ever doubt, like say five years go by and you've like unleashed the political scandal and like opened up the new world Illuminati, whatever, and there's doubt, you can come forward and say, I'm now going to risk my life. I'm the dude. Here's the private key to prove it's me. Oh, look, it unlocks the file over there that also proves it's me and backs up everything I released for the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. So there are lots of ways to go about this. And it's just interesting that we haven't even had to resort to that. BitTorrent well, and mean, Sweden you know, are enough. It's like, the, it's like an old movie situation where there's a conspiracy, right? One guy has a half of a thing, and then another guy has the other half of the thing. You know, like Indiana Jones. I got the rod. I got the pendant. Oh, we put them together. Oh, shit. You know? It's like we proved that it's the real deal because it goes together and the light shines in the right spot. Anyway. Okay, so that's WikiLeaks just needs to do a better job of decentralizing, you know, and being more verifying and anonymizing, right? What about the people who don't want to get their shit stolen, right? You're I read, fucked. I read this. Well, actually, no, I read this great article that talked all about this, uh, like, defense network. It's called, like, S Trip something. I forget what the actual acronym was. Um, and basically, what the situation was, they had this network, right? It was like, just for, you know, diplomats to communicate with computers, right? And what happened was is more and more people needed access to the system. So it expanded. Ah, transitive trust always fucks you. It expanded to like over 180 embassies worldwide. And then, right, on top of that, they, uh, like, all these military people needed access to it. And it like, only takes one jackass in your train of trust to There was everything. something like, you know, num- millions of, Amer- of people who have secret you know, security clearance and had access to the system. And supposedly the system was supposed to have the following security measures. Everyone had supposed to have a really hard password that uh-huh. expired every 150 days. Uh-huh. And anything that was ever plugged into a USB port on any machine logged into the system was supposed to be marked as requiring secret clearance. And even people who were plugged in their iPods to such a machine were supposed to have the iPods confiscated and, you know, that whole, right? That well, never works. Right, all that stuff. And there was like an alarm that would go off on the system if there was anything compromised possibly on the machine. But then like soldiers in Afghanistan were like complaining that the alarm just kept going off and was so annoying and all the security was just causing a hassle. So they actually turned it off for a period of time. Oh, so even then, all right. I, I, I assume they're using, you know, DVI for their monitors. Yeah. I just have a monitor screen scraper. I'll just turn, I'll take a camera and take a picture of the screen, right? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. The, the major... Uh, flaw here in this system, right, was simply that security, real security, if you actually want to keep a secret on computers these days, because basically the way computers work these days, if you type something into a computer, if it is exists in digital format, you've, you've effectively told the whole world, right? Unless you surround it with some insane physical security, like you have a computer in a vault and the computer has no network access and you type it into that computer and nothing leaves that room and you search everyone who goes in and out of the room. Yeah, I've got to watch out for Tempest. Yeah, something like that, you can have security on a computer. But any networked computer, if you type the letter A, you basically type the letter A to the whole world. What they really need to do is, sadly... Uh, to have any kind of network security, you need to have a huge ass hassle. It is a hassle. Everyone has to have their own goddamn keys. You've got to encrypt and decrypt everything. Every computer that's on this network has to be physically locked down so nobody can even touch the USB port. You know, you've got to have the computers, the hard drives in them. That's like, you know, nothing can be stored on those hard drives at any point in time. They need to be basically like thin clients, you know? Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to step back from that a little bit and and make a much more simple supposition. If the security is going to be a pain in the ass, as it should be for actual real secrets, I mean, 
I'm okay with the government saying because there is an amount of security risk you're willing to take in exchange for the benefits of being able to communicate with computers. Well, yes, well, like I'm about to say, right. we've got an agent, you know, actually like monitoring the nuke situation, like a deep agent who's been living in North Korea for ten years. That is pretty good secret information, and it'd be pretty bad if that got out. That information should not be available to anyone who doesn't need to know it, but. We're way too liberal, at least in the U.S., with our security clearances and with what gets classified. Oh, yeah. Well, that's another problem is that we classify too much. Well, I think that's the main problem. We classify so much that as a result, too many people need access, and as a result, the whole system's compromised. Yeah, if we would only classify what really needed to be classified, which, you know, could be nothing, but, you know, we're we're, we're assuming that we do really need to classify I'll make a reasonable (laughs) argument that that... I think it is reasonable for our government to classify imminent military actions, <laughs> actual espionage that we are currently engaged in, or that while we engaged in it in the past, is still active in some direct form where direct harm could result from it coming out. Yeah, I would just hope that, you know, ideally, you wouldn't have any need or have espionage or military actions. But yeah, anyway, well, that's regardless, a, that's a libertarian that's world totally where- beyond the point that... You, if the action, if you only made Scott? the stuff that needed to be confidential, confidential, there would actually be so little that was confidential that like only a handful of people would actually need access. It could be an incredibly small and tight system, right? Like the red telephone system or whatever. And everything else is just like, well, who cares? You know, you wouldn't really need that much security because it's just it's government information. Let it be public, like it's the law. In fact, I would argue that by making more information like this public information that might actually be damaging, even if it isn't actually technically secret, will be lost in the flood of data. Yeah. I mean, right now, basically, it's like WikiLeaks makes these huge dumps, and it's like the newspapers go in and parse and find the ten, the, the juicy bits. You didn't go and actually look at any of the actual you know, releases I or did. wires, did you? Yeah. I didn't. It's, I it, basically, it's I, so much hassle. I'm gripping through for words like fuck or <laughs> penis or douchebag. Yeah, it's just such a hassle, right? And... You know, it, it, there might be juicy bits in there that no one will ever find because it's just so much data. It's not that much data, actually. Who's going to read all of it? Uh, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people who are going to read all of it. But I'm imagine pretty... if there was that much d- data. Every day? Every hour. Oh. Because think about, all right, basically these are phone lines between diplomats, and they're just talking on the phone kind of all the time. So there's just data piling up constantly. You know, if two, if you have, you, you know, one person can pay attention to one phone conversation in real time. There's at least five, ten, maybe hundreds of conversations going on simultaneously, and this is just diplomats. Add in military. Add in every government agency. Add in the DMV talking to the capital of the state that you're in, right? There is so much you could not even come close to finding all the juicy bits everywhere. It would, it just wouldn't happen. So let it be public, and it won't really be public. It'll just be a big old haystack with a few needles that poke out now and then. It would also just be a general net benefit to society because I think a lot of the corruption, and this is obviously more Thursday territory, and waste that occurs in our government is effectively classified for no good reason. Yep. Like, there should be a fairly serious disincentive to classifying things. If the security is a giant pain in the ass, some senator's not going to classify everything he does because it'll be a giant pain in the ass. Oh, that's all? That is a catch-22, right? Because too much is classified, they they won't make it a pain in the ass Right, security wise. So then everything leaks out. But if they made it a pain in the ass, oh, we couldn't really classify that much because it'd be too much a pain in the ass, you know? It, it, and I do point out, as far as I can tell, nothing top secret is in this. It was all secret and yes, below. Yes, secret is millions of people. Top yeah. secret, I think, is a lot less people. Doesn't Britain? I have, don't know exactly how I many. I think Britain has like another level above top, that, top, like, above top secret. I'm sure there is stuff that is ultra secret. I'm sure there's stuff that the president doesn't know that's like yes. relegated to pictures of the president's penis. <laughs> or his lack thereof, right? You know, stuff like that. I think the president would know. Well, I mean, this stuff, for example, I know is like ultra secret is like when the president goes to stay somewhere, right? They always have two or more possible places he might be sleeping, right? And which one he's actually sleeping in that night is like the ultra secret. See, now, you know what? I'm fine with that, but it shouldn't be secret more than a couple weeks. The thing is, uh, no other leader in the world has anything remotely close to that kind of security. Yeah, but we, uh, our leader comes The under- prime ministers of most countries just drive to work on, in their own cars, 
to be normal fair, cars. I will agree that I think our president has slightly more to worry about than other. Yes, I do, obviously, but I think that they go a little bit overboard, and it also limits the freedoms of the president in a way that I would not tolerate if I were the president. Anyway, yeah. that's a totally another. Oh, I separate would love to be the president. You know, often you'd, you'd, there'd be video on the news of me like running away from the Secret Service. You wouldn't get away; they would get you so fast. Yeah, and that'd be <laughs> awesome. Every day, there's a video of me getting tackled by the Secret they Service. They would hate you so much. You'd have a black eye. You'd have to explain it. <laughs> yeah, Secret I'd be Service like, punch me in the face. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to get a burger. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. <laughs> uh, you got to do the Bill Clinton method, where you have a you know a, a, they clear the route to go to the Mickey D's. Anyway, you could have the chef make you one. You don't need any. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow, we went to presidential security. So yeah, uh, the thing is, if you actually only classified a little bit of stuff and made it a pain in the ass, those few people who needed all those secrets would have the giant pain in the ass security of physical keys and maybe bio scanning and you know, freaking public private ultra encryption and computers that are totally yep. physically separated One -time from the rest pads. of the world. You know how they made perfect encryption back in World War II? One time pad. Old ladies spinning bingo things, pulling out random letters and handwriting one time pads. Mm. That's pretty damn random. That's about as good as it gets. Yeah. Uh, we could do it a little faster. We could use ultra bingo instead of regular bingo. We have way more old ladies now. That's where five bingo balls come out at once, and there's <laughs> ten old ladies. Bingo bus is coming. Anyway. Done. So now you've got, so we've told you how to secure the government information and how to be better at being WikiLeaks. How do, what do you do if you're the guy trying to get the government information and give it to WikiLeaks? Well, let, let's do two things there, because the, the, I don't want to talk about general personal security, but I think our last two sides of this are that... I want to release ultra-secret information and be cool like WikiLeaks. And then the side effect is, if I'm that person, how do I protect my own personal evil stuff? Well, yeah, you got to, how do you get the information and then how do you not go to jail forever? Because let me tell you, they're not really going after WikiLeaks so much, right? The authorities. They're going to try to find they're, out who dumped this. The people who leak these things to WikiLeaks are going to get the hammer brought down on them so hard. How, it is going to be like Thor is going to go, oh, shit. I, look what at the is, hammer come down. What is funny, <laughs> however, is that many of these cables were basically leaders of other Arab nations saying, yeah, just between you and me, fuck Iran. I'm <laughs> doing a job. Just bomb the shit out of him for all we care. Seriously. Yeah. All right. You, you want to do All right. So you do it, Big Mouth. That's what I would say. Yeah. So, but a lot <laughs> of Oh, it, you don't have the balls to do it. That's what I thought. A lot of it was basically the entire Arab world being... Yeah, we can't say this publicly, but they're the biggest threat to the Middle East right now. Yeah. And Ahmadinejad came out today. After, you know, obviously he read all this. And th that's it's funny. It's kind of like seeing a group of friends where someone just like played back the phone conversation that no one else had heard, mm -hmm. and now everyone's pissed. Anyway, so but he came out and he basically tried to say that the entire cable leak was orchestrated by the U.S. government to discredit his regime. Uh -huh. Anyway. But if you want to do the leaking, you basically, one, you should use TrueCrypt. You've got to have deniable encryption. You've got to be, you've got to actually, like, if you care about this level Number of security. Number one, take advantage of the really shitty security that we just described. Yes. <laughs> if their security is really high, don't even bother, because if the security is high enough, it'll basically be impossible for you to actually do anything. Right, you know, you'll have your own key, and then they'll know. Up, oh, that was the key that was used. We know who did it. And Munch. even even if you didn't do it, it was your key. So odds of you doing it are very high. So you're going to, you know, you're going to bite the bullet. For but it. thing you might think of number one, munge the data. That's a technical term for say you find you've got a photograph of like American soldiers committing a war crime or something. Mm. Like you've got the photograph. Don't just put it on the internet because there's a not unreasonable chance that there's some sort of steganographic key or watermark that might identify it back to you mm. especially don't put the actual file that you got what you here's is well, the one to open it up in the gimp and save it as a jpeg a couple of times <laughs> that's not the best idea or here's what you really want to do take a picture of the monitor and then use that as the photo that's a good idea uh what really the thing is they might even get the information out of that what you really want to do is you want to get some really good photo doctoring we're talking about a photo right so let's say I got a photo of Rim shooting somebody, right? And oh my God, that shouldn't have happened. He's like just hosing civilians down, babies, right? Let babies me doc let me doctor this photo to get a picture from the other angle. So now you don't even realize, you know, it's still a picture of right what it is, but you don't even, you know, it's it's basically a completely doctored photo that looks like. And they might come out and say, oh, that photo was doctored. See, I was about to say, there's the danger in the more you munch something, the more people might try to discredit it. Yeah, that's true. But that's why the insurance file 
then th- this is this is part two. We'll get to that later. If you take the original original and you put it out there encrypted and you've got the private key, say you get arrested, you can use that as straight up blackmail. Yep. <laughs> to possibly get out of it. And the thing is, right? You know, even if you what are they gonna do? Even if they give you the death penalty and you go to death row, you still get to mail a letter to somebody. You just write that key down in the mail into the post office. Obviously, and... if the if the government was serious, they just wouldn't deliver that letter. They just take it. <laughs> the point is, you could still get it out somehow, right? You get last words that are then published. What are your last words? A Q R seven. Government's six, not five, stupid. Nine. You know what they would do? They'd munch that shit. The thing is, it would, you know, people, it would work no, out. No, you've got to be more clever about it. Your mom's got to have it. Maybe you wrote it on the wall somewhere. Uh, like you graffitied it somewhere no one would ever look. You got to do the hand of electric trick with the classified ads. That's a good <laughs> trick. Actually, I would argue that that's what a lot of spam is. And in fact, if I was going to distribute, you know, text data or munge photographs in a way that I really needed to be there in case I got off. Spam guy, good idea. Spam is how I would do it. Yeah. I, I mean... Because the guy who sent the spam, he just says, I don't know, I got this spam and I got some money from some bank account and I sent my spam. And now everyone in the world has this picture. So, say... Or not even just the picture, steganographic spam even. Mm. Steganography, in terms of distribution... Especially because usually you're not alone. Like, say so there's you're an a guy. image in the spam, and then in the image is the is the private key, and then everyone uses yep. the key to decrypt the, the actual photo of the horrible war crime. Like, say you're a guy. Someone would figure it out. Look at the shit that nerds figure out. They would figure it out. Yep. I mean, say you're a guy who gets this information, and obviously you need to munge it. I mean, uh, say it's just a text file. There might be purposefully misspelled words throughout secret documents that are different for every person who accesses them. That's how I would protect documents. Mm. So it'd be really trivial to figure out, you know, yeah, the word road was misspelled six times in this document. The only person whose document was like that was Joe Bob, who works in Alabama. Arrest his fucking ass. Yeah, if anything has access logs, right? For example, this WikiLeaks guy, he dumped basically all these uh, embassy things, right? If he just downloaded them all at once, they can just look in the access logs and be like, oh, here's the only person who downloaded everything at once. <laughs> you want to download like one at a time here and there, and it's got to make sense in terms of stuff that you would be looking at here and there. Also, you, you have can't to be have careful. any sort of usage pattern that is out of the ordinary. You have to be careful not to reveal too much. Like if you take a whole dump of something and put it out, what you did not include is very telling as to what access yeah, you have. Yeah, it's like, you know, so if I dump everything all at once and then release it all at once, we know who did it. If I only look at 10 documents and the release has those 10 documents, it's like, huh, who has access? Who looked at these 10 documents and no other documents? Oh, that guy, right? Your access pattern and your usage patterns cannot match up with the You dump. know what I just realized? There's probably some schmuck somewhere who was told by, like, an IT manager to take, a, like, an archive and he downloaded everything like a week ago. Better and he's yet, he's totally getting arrested. Better <laughs> yet, someone else, right, does all the using, and you know, it's all the access logs have their name on it, right? So your friend looks at a document, you 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 dump it, and you get the document from him. Someone else looks at a document, you get the document from them. Someone else gets a document, you get the document from them. So now you're collecting documents from all these different users of the system. And I'll point right? out, you want all these documents easily. Be an IT guy. Yeah. So you've collected 100 documents from, you know, 50 different people. And then when they go and they say, who does this dump, you know, who has an at usage pattern that matches this dump? Nobody. So now it's like, well, what the, who the fuck did it? We have no way to tell. So you've got to munch the data, you know, do some SEDs, throw some random stuff here and there just to, to throw it off. If you can, do a statistical analysis and look for any anomalies. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't really have any advice on specifically how to do that. <laughs> I also don't want to aid in event be, felons. Be a computer scientist. Or a, or a math statistician. Yeah. Uh, and then now you've got to get these uh, documents and you got to give them to the WikiLeaks guys. You know, they have a procedure for well, doing that. Well, in general, that. in general, if you, you've, you've gotten some sort of document and you want to get it out to the public through an intermediary as opposed to directly. Yeah, that's you, why WikiLeaks exists. You no, don't want to put up your own thing. Steganography and strange... Uh, basically, here's an example. So I go to a Counter-Strike server and I spray the picture on the wall mm. and someone looks at it. Who the fuck is going to be monitoring that. Yeah, you go into a Counter-Strike server, spray the URL of some IP address of some machine that you set up in a Starbucks, right, uh, you know, on the wall. And then people will start visiting the, the web server that's hiding in the corner. You just uh, you left a oh, laptop no, you... under the couch in a Starbucks connected to the wireless 
plugged into an outlet that's behind the couch, and it's running this web server that's serving up all this shit. It'll take them a long time to go find that, and by then, people have downloaded everything from the laptop. Now, not that useful for direct or distribution to people you don't know that well, because you either have to set these they're things gonna, up The thing is, they're going to check the security cameras in the Starbucks, so make sure that you're in with the Starbucks before, uh, you know. Or drive by, do it outside, use a Pringles can from a car down the road. Yeah, make you got to do it somewhere where there is no security cameras, because they'll see you setting up this computer. You know, you got to do it, like, in, you know, behind, the back alley behind the Starbucks. You know, and get uh, it p- late at late at night, uh, car battery hooked up to a netbook or even just a netbook with dressed, a good battery dressed in all black. Right. With a with an Ubuntu live CD. Yes. that's just sitting there transmitting the data. That is something right. When law enforcement get, gets a computer, basically what they do is they examine the hard drive on, you know, the bit level. Oh, I don't have a hard drive. Oh, there's no hard drive in this computer. Right. They probably made a stupid move and turned it off. And now everything that was in RAM is gone. And what's left in the computer? A live CD that's got a blank OS with nothing on it. They lost everything, <laughs> you know. I think we've talked about that specific idea before because that's like 101, how to distribute data. But a good plan, this is more for the people who are really serious about this, paranoid types. Physical giving to someone? Oh, no. Having predefined codes among people you trust. I'll give you an example, a very personal example. And this is something I did with some friends. This isn't even FRC people. This is just some other people I know out in the wide world. I haven't talked to some of these people in years. There's a code word that we came up with, and it was our oh shit code word. And basically, it refers to a place, a time, a color, a whole bunch of different unrelated things. And to know what it's referring to requires context. So if the shit hits the fan, we know, if we don't hear anything from anyone, meet at the place referred to by Daedalus at the time referred to by Daedalus. Mm-hmm. That's my word. You'll n- No one's going to remember this, and I don't plan to use this word, but... Mm-hmm. So, you know, have your Daedalus word. So, say I tell Scott, you know, I'm being arrested, and I yell, the color Daedalus. And Scott knows that's the color purple, which we also know refers to this diner we ate at at Oticon four years ago. And I probably left something in the bathroom there hidden. Yep. You know, something like that. A code, an actual the thing is, code. thing is, hiding something in a bathroom isn't really still going to be there, right? You got to do a better job than that. Well, when I say in a bathroom, I mean like when I found those drugs in the wall behind the urinal <laughs> <laughs> at that rest stop. <laughs> there are ways to hide things in places no one will ever look. The thing is, right, is like or I've, just, the, I've uh, seen people hiding stuff like in telephone, you know, <laughs> booths, in payphone thingies in New York City. And it's like. Uh, yeah, you know, that's not really a very good hiding Well, it place. depends on what the long-term or short-term is. And usually when I say these codes, you know, those are just examples. The long-term codes are the ones that are contextual to where you use the code. Like, say you say, you know, I've got the data. I'll give it to you at Daedalus. And your friends out there know what that means. Maybe they remember that that means log into this Counter-Strike server, you know, X hours after you make that statement. And it'll be there in a specific form. Mm-hmm. And just have... Yeah, you definitely... Want, that's the thing. With a game like Counter-Strike, right? You're pretty good because you can run the server yourself in a safe place and not have any logs or anything. And you can even connect to it in an encrypted way with SSH tunnels, right? MMOs are probably better. Yeah. No, MMOs are actually probably worse because there are logs on some server you do not control. The, you know, the Blizzard server or whatever. Well, it right. depends on what. But, you're however, going for. Uh, you know, it's like if I have a Counter Strike server, everyone can SSH to it, perfectly secure, and then through the SSH tunnel, connect to the Counter Strike server or IRC server that's running on local hosts only on that server, right? And then that's it. Doesn't get better than that. Yep. You know? Maybe you've got a Hamachi out there just waiting no, for someone to connect. Nobody's gonna. You know, there's no way that they're gonna. They're just gonna see someone's got a hosted machine at Linode. It's running a website for some bl- a WordPress blog. I guess the, the moral of yeah. all that, because obviously we jumped around a whole bunch just now, is have a data list of some kind, which I'm just going to say means way before you plan to engage in any sort of espionage or anything like this, you have to have already established uh, an intelligence groundwork, mm. as in drop locations, trusted friends, codes between friends. You have to lay this stuff you know, down. I mean, even public-private keys don't work unless you share public keys with everybody. You've got to lay this stuff down years before you decide to do anything shady if you actually really care about the security and effectiveness of said shadiness. Mm-hmm. Wow, we're basically giving people the like the solid book for how to commit crimes. It's not how to commit crimes. But it's, it could be used for that. It I doesn't realize. matter. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Well, I guess... I, I mean, what's... If it's criminal to tell people, hey, people, look, use the publicly and freely available open source SSH technology... To do whatever you want. It's like... It, it, I'm surprised the government is not... Entitled, you know, the fact they the did. government doesn't they did. use this... Remember when the government tried to declare PGP a no, munition? No, I'm not saying that. I'm surprised they haven't made it illegal. I'm surprised they aren't using it themselves. They're so stupid. Oh, we already know why. Because there's too much classified information, and as a result, too many people need access, and it's too much of a pain in the ass, so the security is dumbed down to the lowest common senator. All right, so to be secure... That's my new term, the yeah. LCS, the lowest common senator. So TLDR, <laughs> uh, to steal information, find someone who's not being secure enough, and to be secure... Go through the pain in the ass of all this stuff you have to do to make it you yeah. know, secure. I mean, think, it would be a real pain in the ass for me and Scott to now establish a whole series of dataless words and drop points and procedures and plans. And if any of us gets arrested and X days go by, do, you know, all these things that you've just got memorized. And it would take, we'd have to set this up now if we wanted to do something four years from now. Yep. Maybe we should set this stuff up now. It's all you. <laughs> See, the laziness. Because well, I'm not into that. It's not my uh, department. I'll take a departure because I don't know if we'll be able to do a Thursday on WikiLeaks. we got other Thursdays coming up. But from a moral perspective, I would just like to say that I, while I respect the fact that people may die as a result of WikiLeaks, I am currently of the mind that an organization like WikiLeaks is very important to the well-being of the world because too much is too secret right now. Yeah, I'm also, basically, my, my general feeling is if you are in a situation where just the availability of information is a serious threat to you, then that means that you have security through obscurity and not actual security, and that's the real problem. But at the same time, for example, say there is a top-secret document. Obviously, there hasn't really been anything top-secret on WikiLeaks like this. Yep. Like... You know, we've got a real operative who's... I'm just going to make up something crazy. He's in the inner circle of the, the North Korean government. Basically, when the time comes to invade, he is there ready to basically shut down the command and control system to prevent the artillery from going off to Seoul. And we're just waiting to activate him when the invasions happen. I'm okay with the government keeping that secret. Yeah, kind of. I'm 100% okay with that. Mm. However... But I mean, if we've I, the if thing we've is, you know, just from I ideals, you don't even need that guy. Yeah, pragmatism, we need that guy. <laughs> yeah, pragmatism, we need that guy. Scott, ideals, ideals, we don't need that guy. I'm gonna argue why ideals don't work in this situation. We have to go with rationalism and rationalism and pragmatism. Is that what is the moral of Trigun? Not that pacifism is a failed philosophy that you should try for anyway, but that one gigantic asshole can ruin everybody's day. Yeah, there are gigantic assholes, and until we solve that. We have to be pragmatic. I'm okay with keeping espionage secret as long as the espionage is being used ostensibly for the betterment of the world. But if people weren't dicks, you wouldn't need to espionage them. Yeah, I know. I agree. But people are dicks. Stop being a dick. Dude, I ran into a dick on the sidewalk on the way home from work. He was yelling at some guy who bumped into him like a dick. I mean, there's people like that. Those people are not good. Yeah, I don't know what to do about that. That's You're a separate problem. <laughs> but... Considering that most of what WikiLeaks has released are things that I don't think should have been hidden anyway, like, while the Iraq War stuff was harmful in a lot of ways, and it possibly did kill people, I would argue that, the, that hiding war crimes is a worse crime, almost, than having the war crimes having been committed. Because that is willful. That yeah. is willful on a level that I just can't abide in. Yeah. You know, you have to really examine each different piece of information that was leaked. And make a judgment on each and every yes. one individually. I mean, I'll say this. Say I found... And the, the, the thing that, you know, the fact is, the vast majority of the, the, the text that was leaked is of no interest to anyone. And so, therefore, you know, really, what's, what's the problem? Here's two examples. Say I found, on my own, evidence that the Democrats and the Republicans colluded together to control government, some vast conspiracy. I would leak that, like, without even thinking. Me? Say I found direct evidence that the United States was directly right now planning a joint coalition invasion and pacification of North Korea followed by an occupation, and I somehow had all the plans for it, I wouldn't leak that shit. <laughs> I, I just let it go. I'd let them do it first. Now, once it happened, within a reasonable well, what, here's span, the thing. What if you didn't want them to do it? Well, then I'd leak it. Also, right, think about this, right? Theoretically, at least, right? They have this plan to do this thing. 
If the plan is a good, really good plan, then the plan will work whether the other guy knows no. your plan or not. No, because I think it's a really good plan to have a 20-year agent who is now like the head <laughs> of the Korean military, who when the invasion happens, it's just like, I'll launch all the artillery. You guys get in the bunker. And then he's like, yeah, they're all down there. Come on in. It's like, you That's know, a great plan. It depends if it's like... Stra- That's a really great plan. Here's the thing. Is it Stratego or is it Advance Wars, right? Is there Fog of War or is there not? So here's the thing. In the real world, Fog of War. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we've gone on enough. I'm, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm Wait. also hungry. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.